Good morning. This is uh, the House Health Care Committee of the Vermont House of Representatives. It is Wednesday, February 17th. And this morning we are continuing our, uh, we continue to hear testimony on a bill at uh, H210 that was introduced on the floor of the House last week and is has been taken up for consideration um, by the House Health by our House Health Care Committee. Uh, last week we heard from um, we heard the introduction of the bill from Representative China, who's the lead sponsor, and from the Racial Justice Alliance, uh, a number of members of the Racial Justice Alliance, who uh, helped. Uh, craft the bill, had a lot of input into the bill. This morning, it's our intention to hear from the Department of Health, the Vermont Department of Health, uh, about S-210, uh, because in fact, the bill touches on uh, directly on the Vermont Department of Health. And so uh, with us this morning, we have Heidi Klein. Uh, and then we also have uh, from our own joint fiscal office, um, Nolan Langwell, who will um, review with us a fiscal note on the bill. So, but first, let's hear. Let's turn to uh, uh, Heidi Klein, and I see you are with us. But I don't. There you are. Okay. Yeah. Great. Good morning. Good morning, all. Thank you for having me today. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, is the audio strong enough? It sounds great. Yeah, you're, you're loud and clear. Okay. All right. Well, I have met some of you before. Um, as introduction, um, I am Heidi Klein. I serve as Director of Planning uh, within the Commissioner's Office of the Department of Health. I've been in that position for about four years now. Uh, the Office of Planning includes four major areas. It includes long-range planning for the department, so our strategic plan as well as development of the state health improvement plan, which you'll hear me reference later. It also includes workforce development, performance management, and probably most relevant to this discussion is it includes our efforts related to health equity. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how we've looked at um, this bill and the ways in which it aligns nicely with a lot of the work that uh, we have been working towards over the last few years in ways in which I think it pushes us into new directions um, and requires some new thinking. Um, as I understand it, the bill proposes first to establish an Office of Health Equity within the Commissioner's Office uh, to establish the Health Equity Advisory Commission to issue grants for the promotion of health equity, to collect data to better understand health disparities in Vermont, and um, also to invest in uh, growing our medical profession and uh, continuing medical education. Yes. I would say in, in general um, and in concept, the health department supports this bill. Uh, as I said, it's very much in line and I will share some of that alignment with the direction of uh, the governor over the last few years and certainly also with our health department. Um, I think our only concern is the ability to carry out um, the differential duties, both of the director of the Office of Health Equity and providing the necessary supports to uh, the advisory commission, um, recognizing that uh, what's outlined in the bill really requires requires a long-term commitment by multiple staff um, and over multiple years. So this would require a long-term investment and right now uh, we just need to call out what that would look like. So for alignment, I think probably you've already had chance to review, but I would call your attention to the state strategic plan, which was developed under Governor Scott. Uh, one of the areas of import for this conversation is the vulnerability theme which I think speaks very directly uh, to looking at populations. Um, they use the word vulnerability, uh, but if you look at it directly, it really is about looking at populations that have um, higher risks for poorer health outcomes based on historic um, injustices, historic disinvestment, um, and based on um, a variety of factors. It also fits very nicely with um, alignment with the work that we've done in the health department, 
uh, some of you may be aware that in 2018, we carried out what we called our state health assessment and followed that with our state health improvement plan. This is something that we produce every five years. And uh, the last time around, we chose specifically to focus on health equities. Uh, historically, our state health assessment looks at what are the most important or, or concerning health conditions across all populations. Um, and this time we decided to say, hey, instead of looking at it across populations, let's look at what are the populations that are most likely to experience poor health outcomes. And when we flipped that switch, uh, we were able to say that actually, if we look closely at our data, we can say that there are disproportionate health impacts among our, our um, populations of color, our populations of people living with disabilities, people living in poverty, and people who identify as LGBTQ and I, that we see persistent uh, differences in uh, health outcomes among those populations in focus. Um, we can, I, can, I, can I interrupt and just ask you to, re sure. to just list again those particular sure. populations? Because absolutely, a, I, I think they're familiar to us, but I think it's important to hear that as part of the broader context that absolutely. the population so when, that you, yeah. the Department of Health has itself identified. Yep, and so when we looked at our data to try and see where are there populations that consistently are experiencing poorer health outcomes compared to their counterparts, what we looked at, when we looked at our data to the extent that we were able, we identified what we called our four populations in focus. And the first population were our populations of color. And so that included uh, our black indigenous people of color, uh, included, um, and so that, that was the first one. The second were uh, people living with disabilities, mm -hmm. uh, populations uh, that identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or- LGBTQ. Right. Um, and then our people living in poverty. And so historically in Vermont, we, we often look and we can tell that we have disparities based on poverty Everybody knew that and we, we sort of took that as a given, but we wanted to really look at our quantitative data to tell us what is it that we are seeing quantitatively in terms of both poorer health outcomes and poorer health opportunities, right? And so we looked at the outcomes, we looked at the opportunities, and then of course we looked at the behaviors. But one of the things that was really important in the way that we address this is recognizing that um, behaviors often uh, present themselves in the context of opportunities and we have disparate opportunities amongst different communities, right? And it's not just geographic communities because we are comfortable with geographic communities, but we were also talking about communities of identity. Uh, and these are the ones that we found by looking at the data. Um, we also did some qualitative research uh, in, in our assessment to figure out sort of what were, what, helped us to understand why, the why, not just the what, but the why. Uh, and if we were to begin to think about how to make change, what would change look like? Um, and so the state health assessment, and I'll, I'd be glad, to, I'll send you the links after this meeting, um, really outlines what we learned in terms of people's experiences, um, both with their own health and then also very much with the uh, interfacing with the healthcare system. And so from that data, uh, we developed what was called the State Health Improvement Plan, which laid out a number of strategies that are intended for us as a state, not as a state health department, but as a state to be able to move forward to address the persistent health problems and look at the changing, changing the conditions of people's lives to make it, um, it more possible for all Vermonters to obtain healthy living. Um, I think one of the things to be that's really important, and I think it really reflects again some really nice alignment with the direction of this bill, is that in the development of both the state health assessment and the state health improvement plan, we actually pulled together a group of over 90 state entities, whether and some of them were other agencies. Some, and many of them were um, nonprofit entities that are serving populations. Uh, the populations in focus. And then um, we had, we struggled much more to actually reach people with lived experience, uh, those who are not paid to show up and advocate 
on behalf of themselves or be part of an organization. But that was why we did our, um, our qualitative um, data mining, because what we did is we had representatives, for example, um, from the Abenaki tribe or from um, the Pride Center who were part of our, our advisory group. But then what we, when we really wanted to figure out what people's experiences were, we asked to be invited to sort of mini focus groups with those organizations and their members in order to be able to hear more directly from uh, people with lived experience and use that to inform the, both what data we should look at as well as what strategies would be useful. And in many ways, it sounds, you know, that sounds very akin to uh, what this bill proposes in terms of the role of an advisory commission, um, the ways in which we used the advisory committee for the state health improvement plan. So I think there's really nice alignment there. Um, I think the other piece that I would say in terms of alignment is um, the health department, as you see, has committed some resources within our um, department uh, by having health equity as, an, uh, as a priority in our state health assessment, in the planning office, and I, I report uh, within the executive committee to the commissioner. Um, and with trying over the number of years to continue to build more capacity, understanding within our own staff and to promote health equity. Um, and we, I think it really is highlighted by uh, the work that we've been able to do in our COVID response. And I'm, I know we will continue to struggle to meet all of the needs and be as responsive as many, including ourselves would like to be, but given how fast and furious we are going, I wanted to share with you, um, you know, the ways in which I think this response to our current crisis with COVID highlights the need for a spotlight on equity, and it also highlights the need for greater investment in um, staff and funding to really meet the needs. Um, and so, as I said, while we feel like there's great alignment uh, between what this bill proposes to do, the concern is that it is under-resourced in order to accomplish what it is. Um, and I'll give you just an example of why I would say that. Um, in our COVID-19 response, we started off with um, one person assigned to trying to look across the enterprise of our response within the health department for health equity um, to make sure that we were in everything that we did had a health equity lens, right? Um, however, um, we are now up to eight staff who are focused specifically to our COVID response and we could probably use more. Uh, but I'll give you an example of what we've been able to accomplish with those eight staff. Um, and I think, again, it's a microcosm of what is being asked for in this bill, because we have been able to publish data. Uh, we have weekly summaries on the health of Vermonters and the differential impacts of COVID-19 on our different populations. We've been able, thankfully, with some additional external federal funding uh, to fund community partners uh, specifically for um, carrying out um, activities related to COVID and those have included the Abenaki, Helping Abenaki, Racial Justice Alliance, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, uh, the Vermont De Developmental Disabilities Council and Outright Vermont to uh, name a few. We've also been able to target special uh, testing opportunities in our English language learning communities and we've really focused on translation. And that's just a tiny bit of what actually is needed um, and I think that is uh, the, the message that I would love to continue to share is that this is work that is going to require long-term investment um, of time, money, and staff, and we're there with you if we can make it work. And that is part of the, I think we've built some of the frameworks within state government, the strategic plan of the governor, the state health improvement plan of the health department. But what we haven't been able to do is go this next level that this bill is asking for. And I would say this bill is asking us to do a lot of new things that we haven't been able to do. So um, by creating an office of health equity, um, the, we would, the 
issue of providing grants requires us to have grants to give out. Um, it, uh, we realized when we did have the luxury of uh, new grants because of COVID, it was a full-time job uh, of someone to manage that money and be able to do all the pieces in terms of reaching out to individuals and organizations that frankly, the ones that we are trying to reach may not have the infrastructure and support yet to be able to catch the money to be able to spend it. So um, creating and providing grants out requires also providing um, some support to those entities to be able to receive and manage the grants in ways that we as the state or the federal government will require for tracking, reporting, support, et cetera. So I think it's, it's not just grants out, but it's a lot of capacity building that we would need to invest in. Um, what else would be new is developing the plan to uh, increase the number of uh, BIPOC and LGBTQ individuals um, in the healthcare systems. That's not something that we have traditionally done. Um, and I know it is a mandate <clears throat> that would need to be looked at more closely in terms of what it would take to uh, both do that as well as uh, the pieces related, the other pieces related to healthcare. That is not something that we have uh, been actively involved in. Um, the other piece that would be very different is the advisory commission. Um, and it was, a you know, um, the advisory commission has a fantastic set of entities. It seems to cover um, the key portions of state government as well as those organizations outside of government who would need to work together um, collaboratively in order to achieve what the bill puts out to be. Um, and um, I, our concern is that um, the, the role, the staffing of that advisory committee would require a full-time person as well. Um, as you probably know, given the work that you all do, uh, what it takes to wrangle uh, and uh, support, uh, whether it's the public hearings or the review of legislation um, and then providing assistance to a commission to do its work requires some support. Um, and so, I guess I'm going to wrap up so that you have time to ask me questions. But I think, you know, again, bottom line, I think um, we're we are excited about the direction because it very much aligns with the work that we've been pushing for for many years and it aligns with what our data tells us about um, disproportionate health impacts of Vermonters, um, and that that's uh, we are committed um, to ensuring that we continue to address that. Um, I think the, the, however, we are concerned that if the committee would like to move ahead with this, that you consider um, what it would take to actually support all the work that is required here. Um, and so in my mind, having, you know, lived in the state health department for the last seven years, when I, you know, a quick read of what I've seen it, are the responsibilities, I would imagine we would need a director as, as identified I also think the advisory commission would do well to have its own staff support. Um, and that uh, it, if there are to be the level of grants that are identified and the ability to get those out to the communities who need them most, um, that a grants manager position, um, having data analysis is critical. As you know, um, we should always be uh, data driven and evidence informed. Um, as we do our work and the data itself is critical to this work. And then it looked like there was a lot of policy analysis. So when I look at that, knowing what I know of working within the health department within our state um, health system, I think that there are a number of different positions and responsibilities that are outlined here in order to support this work that really is, you know, a multi, multi year effort. Um, but probably in line with what we have been talking about needing uh, throughout the state. So I'm gonna end right there. And I, I don't know how your process works. I see that I'll two take, I'll take charge of the hands. I assume that's your job, right? Yeah, that's my job. Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you. It's great, to, it's great to hear from you this morning. And uh, before we're gonna take questions, but let me just say initially, uh, it's uh, actually very hopeful to hear how much in alignment uh, this bill is with uh, the work that the Department of Health has been uh, undertaking for some period of years, both in terms of your policy analysis, uh, which uh, the areas of uh, 
uh, on where poor, poor health outcomes are uh, seen uh, aligned, I think, directly with what what this committee has been thinking about at times uh, in terms of COVID relief, emergency relief, but also with the, the bill as outlined. Uh, but I'm going to turn and, and then there, and we, so anyway, I mm -hmm. could, I could go on, but let's turn to uh, some of the questions we have. And uh, so I'm going to turn first to Representative China, then Representative Donahue, Representative Page. Um, first, I just want to thank you for, for, um, for giving us like a, like sort of an honest assessment of the, of the cost that would be involved in implementing this idea. Um, because, you know, if we're going to do something, we should do it right. And it's always good to have somebody share like sort of what we're missing to do this right. And it sounds like we would need to build more um, capacity for staffing and we would, and we would need to appropriate more resources to this work if we're going to do it the right way. Um, a, a question I have though is, you know, anytime we're, we're spending money on something is sort of what impact will that have in the long term? on what we, you know, in other words, by doing this, are we in some way saving money or is there a cost that is going to be reduced that's currently happening with the way the system is? For example, by addressing health inequities, are we actually investing in, um, are we investing, by investing in, in, in addressing health inequities, are we reducing the cost on people that's, happening under the current system. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm curious if you could speak to that, you know, to sort of like, what's the trade off of by doing this, what is the benefit? Like, what are we saving by spending money on this? So. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the question. And, and I'm a true uh, public health professional, which means I believe in long-term change and recognize that like investments today often don't yield immediate results, right? That the, the, the way in which you have to measure success can be 15 to 20 years down the road, right? And it can be intergenerational as opposed to immediate. And so the immediate reduction in cost, it's, it's hard to quantify, except uh, if you look at the conditions of people's lives, and I mean, when we talk about health, we mean both physical and mental health, and um, some people call behavioral health a different category, but when we look at uh, the ways in which uh, people are currently suffering, if there's anything that by doing, you know, investing in this way, we can bring down the physical and mental angst to the individual, that's important. If we are able, more importantly and more likely, to create better systems of support, change uh, our approaches so that we're investing a little bit further upstream in those conditions that are creating the health outcomes, we are doing that not only for the individual, but more importantly for the, the community so that we are not perpetuating the, the, the problem or the cost down the line. That's a generational change, right? And so it, is, it would be hard for me to, to specifically quantify, um, but we do know in public health that when we make investments, um, like example, so if we, you know, Stopping smoking was a 20 to 30 year campaign, but look what it's yielded us, right? We also know investments in making it easier for people to um, walk or ride their bicycle ha in a community improves the community value. It, include, it improves health outcomes. So that investment in an infrastructure to make um, health easier to obtain makes a huge difference. Now, again, it's an investment not in healthcare, but it's further upstream. So I got a little bit big on you with my answer representative, but I, but I think that it's just, it's really hard to quantify. Um, I think where we have been uh, looking in the work that we're doing in the health department uh, is also about um, the, the changes in how we think about what data we look at, what programs we fund, uh, what's, what policies we put forth that will set forth changing the default expectation to be inclusive. And that, that's, um, I don't know how you measure that, the, the, the funding that is saved that way, but that's the investment that we need. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm going to let me let me throw out a question, which I'm not going to ask you to respond to right now, but just to have in your mind as others are asking questions as well, uh, along the lines of uh, because there is in fact a current investment in the Department of Health around addressing health disparities. Uh, one would think that it would not require simply new additional yeah. resources, but the realignment of some current resources in addition to new resources. Mm -hmm. And so I would ask uh, that we be thinking about that as well, because mm -hmm. clearly mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Department of Health has made some significant investment to come to the place where it is currently, although this bill, as you accurately say, uh, would, and, and it wouldn't be, <laughs> the bill would have no purpose if it did not actually take us further and require the department to move further. But I think there are some, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps there are some reorganizational or realignment of current resources in addition to additional resources that would uh, help underwrite the, this initiative. So let's, let's be thinking about that as we, uh, as, as the committee and, and, and invite your help to think about mm -hmm. that as well mm -hmm. along the way. Uh, Representative Donahue. Thank you. Um, I, I first want to uh, thank you for your uh, your reference to the distinction between mental health and um, health behaviors, which go across mental and physical health. It, that people use the term behavioral health and and don't apply it um, in that way, in that correct way. So thank you. Um, a general question which turns into a focus on a, a specific, and that is the relationship between the work of the health department and um, how uh, closely you work with the Green Mountain Care Board um, on health system initiatives, and then very specifically in terms of get data gathering, whether you've seen uh, the proposal of the Green Mountain Care Board to be able to uh, capture uh, data uh, related to uh, race and ethnicity in order to help guide this work and whether that seems to be, you know, uh, a, a good or a not so good way of jumpstarting some of that specific data gathering. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, I have to confess prior to COVID, um, we did a lot of work with the Green Mountain Care Report. So prior to COVID, um, I would say a, a significant part of my work in particular was actually about health systems reform uh, and working with members of our healthcare communities uh, to look in ways in which they could um, expand the way they thought about healthcare to include population health, which is I think really what the Green Mountain Care Board is looking at in ways of thinking beyond individuals to populations, beyond treatment to prevention, right? Um, and, and looking at ways of supporting uh, people in community in different ways. So that we did a tremendous amount of work with Green Mountain Care Board prior. I have to say in the last year, um, it's been all COVID all the time. And so eyes have not been as, as closely there. Um, so I don't know exactly what they're asking about the race and ethnicity data. I will tell you though, um, when we were doing our state health assessment, we were asked by many to give much more detailed information about differences uh, in the data uh, based on a person's uh, race, ethnicity, um, and self-identification. And the problem is we can't look at the data if it doesn't exist, right? And so most of health data is collected through the healthcare system. We're able to bring uh, survey data where people self-identify, but we don't have healthcare data. Um, and it's that, and we don't have the power to, at, at this point, to in, in require in the same way, uh, the collection of um, race and ethnicity and healthcare data. And so um, I would say, if that is something that the Green Mountain Care Board is doing, it'd be interesting to look at and whether that would fill the gap that we found when we were trying to uh, get at the data in the specific way we wanted for the state health assessment. So, uh, so I, um, I can forward to you um, what those are, but it is very specific. The, the first phase is uh, uh, passing, enabling um, regulations to require health, the healthcare system uh, pieces to submit that data mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. the ability to gather it would be there. 
um, and and uh, they also had some some recommendations related to the data gathering requests in this legislation. So I would love to mm -hmm. share those with mm -hmm. you and maybe get your reaction. Thank you. Okay. Right, and interestingly, um, we do have the authority to require that. So that's at least within certain scope. Uh, we don't have as much authority sometimes as we wish we had in terms of uh, federal preemption, but but there uh, we have a. I'm a, I always I always get a kick, out, and this is not, I'm not this is not saying that you've said this, but I've always gotten a kick out of someone who's saying to me, "Well, we'd like to do that, but we can't because the statute says we can't." And I go, mm -hmm. "Statutes are us. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, we change statutes." So we're we're, we're looking. Uh, so the Green Mountain Care Board testified last Wednesday afternoon, and Representative Donahue, uh, appreciate you being willing to send on that information to. Um, Heidi Klein to mm -hmm. uh, look at and clearly there would be it sounds like it, it would be it would be clearly important to have some further alignment in terms of uh, understanding how to how to really align the collection of data across our health system mm -hmm. so that we could in fact uh, so that you and others could analyze that data on behalf of issues of increasing the health and reducing health disparities mm -hmm. so that 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 has an exciting prospect uh, to, um, that holds, I think that holds, holds uh, real possibilities that we, we, we are, I, I should say many of us are very interested in uh, mm -hmm. taking some initiative there. Representative Page. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Director Klein, um, following up with uh, the Chair, how many people, um, how many individuals do you think your department will um, be required to have uh, for this bill. And, and do you have any idea how much funding uh, will also be required? And as, as the chair asked, could you not just do some realignment of your, uh, your personnel to, um, to uh, take care of this, um, some of the requirements within this bill? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what, you know, I rough it, rough, blah, blah, blah. I roughly was thinking maybe, you know, up to five different distinct positions um, to carry it off over time and effectively. The, the two that I think are um, the data we are doing a lot anyway. So I think that one we probably could absorb if we needed to. We required and made changes internally that um, suggested that any time we are doing a health analysis that we also are looking at and breaking it down uh, to the extent that we can to be able to identify any inequities. So I think that's underway, as you will see in the data that we're producing now for COVID. Um, the support and management of the advisory committee is a full-time job. The support and management of an office across government is a full-time job. Um, we don't, so, and as you, you probably understand, it's a combination of funding and positions for us. Uh, that aren't always in line. Sometimes we have money and no positions. Sometimes we have positions and no money. Uh, so it has to be kind of both. Um, all, almost all the positions, as you will probably know in the health department, um, are assigned, and, and frankly, most of them come through federal funding rather than state funding, our ability to do our work. And if that's true, then we have federal requirements for and deliverables for the grant monies that we come in. So we do our best to make sure our mission and the broader public health mission is always, and the needs of the state are always front and center, but it also comes with a specific deliverable and scope of work. Um, we have definitely worked within our all of our positions to say that health equity is a priority within the department and that staff will be trained and look at the work that they're doing through a lens, but to coordinate across the depart our own department. But then what this bill does is require coordination across multiple departments and then support of a commission that's really quite new. And that, re that requires a lot of time and energy. I'll have you know that um, you know, I just say from experience, when I was responsible for the um, development of our state health improvement plan, which had many aspects, as I said, similar to this, um, this, this bill, 
it was a full-time job for me and I had to find other people to do my other responsibilities. I mean, we always make it work when we have to because that's what we do in public health and that's what we do in state government. But if you want this, you know, sort of in the, if you want this to be successful, it needs to be sufficiently resourced. And how much are you thinking um, that amount would be? You know what, I have, no, I don't, but I'd be happy to consult with others uh, and come back to you with that. It, you know, honestly, this was, you know, Heidi Klein's look on the back of a, a notebook, um, but figuring out, you know, the level of position, the resource that would be needed, I'm happy to consult with the folks if that would be useful to you. Okay. Um, also, you talked about a person that would be dealing with grants, uh, submitting grants, writing grants. Yeah. How much do you actually think um, you would be able to obtain in, in, uh, in grants each year? Oh, that's a fascinating question. And it, as you know, it depends on the disease du jour. Um, so um, right now we have uh, a lot because we have a huge need. Um, I don't know what, um, what I'd love to do is check in with our finance office, if that's okay, uh, and just find out what we've been able to do over time. Uh, the funding piece is not really my sweet spot to, to talk about. Yeah, it would um, be interesting I, to know yeah. Uh, whether the grants that would be brought in by such a person uh, would more than uh, take care of that person's um, salary, if you know what I mean. Right, right. And it depends um, on exactly. Not that they're getting grants to do their salary or anything like that, but, no, but whether but we do. Uh, no, you're absolutely yeah. right that we, when we put together grant proposals, we have to put in some amount of funding to get the proposals in and then out the door, even when we're granting out to others. Can, can, um, I, so jump me, here, yeah. can I jump here for a second? I think, uh, I think you might also be kind of cro crossing wires here, okay. uh, Representative Page. Uh, when, as I was hearing uh, uh, Heidi, Talking, she, she, I think you were talking about a grants manager because the bill calls for granting out monies to other organizations and that that would require a full-time position to oh, okay. be, do yeah. the grants managing. But you've touched on something as well, which I had actually made a note as well to, say, to, to think about what other resources might be leveraged from outside of state government, uh, perhaps federal monies or other uh, philanthropic dollars or other, uh, other dollars through a grants uh, writing process as well. And I think, I think, so I just want to clarify, I think when we're talking about grants yeah. management, I believe Heidi was talking about the position to be able to manage and do capacity building outgoing. for granting outgoing. Yeah. Yeah. Am I okay. correct in that, Heidi? Thank you. Yes. Just, indeed. Don't, I, to be overly familiar. I'm, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. And, and let me say it was um, when we were gifted the opportunity to get some uh, funds out to community through, um, COVID related out to the community from the last legislative session. It was an enormous amount of time and left to be able to get that out uh, and required multiple people who um, man, you know, both got it out, but then also provided support to the grantees to be able to carry forth and do the necessary reporting back uh, because we have a fiscal responsibility that we close that loop. Okay, and then my final question, I swear, um, uh, could you tell me what exactly, what data are you going to be looking for when it comes to healthcare data? Can you, can you go into a little more detail about mm. what exactly that data is? So we, when we look at data in the health department, um, we look at, we're prim primarily looking at health outcome data as opposed to healthcare services data, right? And so it is really our Department of Vermont Health Access um, and the Department of Financial Regulation that tends to be looking more at that healthcare, the healthcare data, meaning the, the data that describes what is happening in the healthcare system. So data related to whether or not people have access to insurance, access to providers, um, et cetera. We do, we, um, so let me just stop and ask, when you say what kind of healthcare data, do you have something in mind? Are you talking about the health of the healthcare system or you're talking about the data about individuals who are interfacing with the healthcare system? Uh, I guess it would be the data that individuals are interfacing with. 
Oh, my, I, I lost you on that. I could, could you repeat that, please? The data that you would be getting from individuals, uh, what, okay. type of, what type of um, data would right. it be? Right. So, you know, we, when we are looking at individuals from um, data that healthcare providers might be collecting, in addition to uh, what they are tracking, there are some basic um, items that we've been um, working with actually the Green Mountain Care Board and others to try and ensure are asked throughout uh, primary care and others to give us a sense of not only an individual's physical um, manifestation in uh, when they go for a healthcare appointment, but what else is going on in their lives that would help us to be able to describe the circumstances which are creating those health outcomes. So for example, uh, you may know we now ask we're asking our healthcare partners to not only be able to ask demographic data, which is different than Representative um, Donahue mentioned that, you know, getting be able to break down by race and ethnicity and by socioeconomic status. But we're also interested um, about whether or not people, when they come in with, with, with um, particularly complex health conditions, um, are there concerns <clears throat> about food security? Are there concerns about housing security? Are there concerns um, about their personal safety? As you know, we changed those questions many years ago to make sure people, we were asking people about their personal safety because those, the, those are the conditions in people's lives that might lead to their health outcome or their ability to manage their own health situation. And so it's really important to have the context of people's lives in order to both understand trends, but also most importantly, how to figure out how to support either through treatment or prevention that individual from um, having their health condition worsen. I don't know if that was specific enough for you, um, sir, but I, I, I can certainly get you more specificity if you'd like it. Yep. I'm on mute, thank you. And uh, I again, I would uh, ask uh, Nolan from our joint fiscal office to uh, contact you to to add to his current fiscal analysis of H210 based on what you've said so that we have a, a range of ideas. Um, and let's turn to Representative Peterson. Yes, thank you. Uh, Director Klein, thank you for your presentation. It was most informative. Um, my questions, uh, some of the questions I have on the bill are around uh, duplication of effort. Uh, redundancy uh, of what you're already doing. Um, I'm concerned that we're, we're establishing something where maybe there's not really a need. And I'm wondering how much of the outcomes outlined in the bill that you, you folks already are, are in progress of doing, are partly doing, and wouldn't it make sense to maybe add a couple people there to get us to where we want to be rather than establish a whole new uh, commission and, and, and bill? I wonder if you could yeah. speak to yeah. that. I know that's involved, but mm -hmm. you know where I'm mm -hmm. getting at. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think it's a fair question because as I, you know, I started with, you know, I think it's very much in alignment with where, where we've been aiming towards. Uh, and what we've been trying to do with the resources that we have. And so I think it's a very fair question to be asking. I think um, the pieces that uh, the commission add that are different, right, um, is it formalizes a structure that doesn't exist right now. So right now we do a lot of individual reaching out. We do a lot of work on our own, but we don't bring people together on a consistent basis for a routine and ongoing conversation. So that that's something that would be different. Okay, could I interrupt you there? Sure. What people are we talking? When you say bring people together, what, so, give yeah. me an example of what that is. So right now we, we as the health department, uh, for example, may have work that we're doing on cancer prevention. And we may then look and see like, oh my goodness, the rates of can a certain type of cancer are much higher amongst um, certain populations. So whether it's our indigenous populations or it's uh, black men, 
we might try and reach out individually to organizations that represent those groups and say, hey, we see this problem. Can you help us think about how to better design the program, understand what's going on, use our resources? What we wouldn't be doing, however, is bringing together those groups with us on a sustained effort, right? And so, and only we would be hearing it. When really, so this is what we learned through the state health improvement plan. Um, all the issues are interconnected. It's all the same. Like if we really go back to like what's driving these poor health outcomes, it's the same bottom drivers. It's poverty, right? It's it, it's racism, poverty, and genderism. That and so, what we do for one community should benefit others, but we're not getting that intersect. And that was a really mouthy way of saying. The difference that this commission would bring is that it would create a space that it's not just the health department, but the Department of Housing and Community Development, that the Department of Children and Families and the health department and the other state entities are together and hearing directly from the, um, the Abenaki, from Pride Vermont from the mental health and disabilities group all together in a way that's looking at how the same issues drive multiple health outcomes. So that that's one piece that's different. The big the other big thing, honestly, is that joint um, grant funding out into community, right? That is definitely new and different. It's not what we're doing now. Right? We try through small grants when we have the ability to do that, but we don't have a routine and systematized way of ensuring that we are looking for grants, we're catching them. You know, when there's, as, as Representative Lippert was saying, outside grants, whether they're federal or philanthropic, and having a way to bring them into the state and then disperse them throughout the state in a way that hits the populations of concern. So that is, that is new and different. I think a lot of the other stuff is, it, it's an addition to what we are already doing, but those two pieces are significantly new and different. Okay, bringing groups together and coming up with a strategy is what you're saying. Yeah, so Versus very, individually handling problems. Exactly, so I would I would say, you know, I know that the legislator op, legislature often will have like a summer commission or a special study group because you realize you need certain thinkers in the room to problem solve something together rather than separately. That's the way that I imagine there's some, some, some correspondence. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let, let me just say, this is not the only time we will uh, be looking at this bill, but we are, we are putting it in front of us at this point because we are also being asked to make some budget recommendations. Uh, both short term today and uh, for the by for the first half of the biennium, uh, we've, we're being asked to make at least our initial recommendations by Friday. Uh, so this is actually helpful. Uh, it's also the case I, if I so we're going to come back and once we finished with this testimony this morning, which I hope we will finish up, which we will finish up uh, in the next ten to fifteen minutes. Uh, because we have other work that we have to do, but this is very helpful, and I think it, it, it contributes to our consider our deliberations. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are there are ways to get from here to there, if I put put it that way, uh, that you don't necessarily uh, have to have everything in place fully in order to start something. Uh, and, and I think many of us have been down that road with different initiatives over the years. So, but this is, but it's very helpful to have your perspective on this uh, as well. So I'm going to turn to, so I had, so Brian, before I uh, turn to you, Representative China, we had also invited uh, Nolan from the Joint Fiscal Office to do a presentation, which, you know, I, and now this is in, in some ways impacted perhaps uh, yeah. differently and additionally based on the testimony we've heard, and that's why we have testimony. and. Uh, but I thought uh, I might have Nolan, uh, we'll hear, hear, yeah, Regina, and hear what your question is and then have Nolan uh, run through that in a brief, in a brief manner, knowing that uh, it may very well need to be uh, further uh, updated based on some of our testimony today. Yeah. 
And if I could just say one last thing in closing, because I would be remiss if I didn't say right now at this moment, and I, I think you heard me say, uh, we are all COVID all yes. the time. And, and so just in terms of the difference between where we are today and what we want to accomplish as a state and um, in public health, I would be remiss if I didn't um, have you know the extent to which our current staff are significantly stressed, under-resourced, um, proud of the work we're doing, but exhausted. Yes. And I think you all just need to know that as we think about um, what we can do versus not, a lot of the information that I shared with you in terms of what we were doing is pre-COVID. Right. All mm -hmm. that is work that we hope to return to at some point, but right now we are beyond max with our ability to address this um, epidemic, which has to be first and foremost, and hopefully is done with an eye towards the disparate impact on different populations. But I, I just placing no, it, okay. I think is really important. To do. I think that's very important. And I really appreciate you making that explicitly clear. Uh, we certainly, uh, I think many of us have deep appreciation for the enormous work of the uh, staff at the Department of Health uh, from your commissioner on down through all of the line staff, uh, which have contributed greatly uh, to Vermont, perhaps being the safest state during this pandemic. Uh, it's, it's, it's making a huge impact and we have deep gratitude for that. And I think we do need to take that into consideration as we contemplate asking the department or the staff to take on any new initiative in the midst of this. At the same time, I think there may be ways that we can uh, consider setting some things in motion, which uh, allow for uh, allow for things to move forward without uh, adding that level of, of stress. But uh, so with that, Noel, or, uh, Brian, uh, so I, I, I would actually welcome you to stay with us if you can. Uh, whoops. Yeah, but you can go off screen if you like. That's fine. But uh, I'm going to my goal right now is to hear from Representative China, then to turn to uh, the Joint Fiscal Office analysis briefly, uh, and then bring this to a close, take a break, and then have our committee come back to our uh, ongoing discussions that we started yesterday. And with that, Brian? Yeah, so I, I'm hesitant to ask the question, but at the same time, I think I will, and maybe um, Director Klein, I'll try to be brief in my question, and maybe you can give us a short answer today, because um, it might lend itself to a big answer. I'm just curious, like during the pandemic, can you give us an example of how you've seen systemic racism affecting people and how might this bill improve that coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, I've seen a few things. Um, I think when we're running so fast and furious, we think of the majority and you know the old 80%, 20% rule. Like if you can get the 80%, you're doing great. And then you'll worry about the 20% later, right? And it's the 20%, this is a terrible analogy, but it's the 20% that are the individuals who are the hard to reach or the people who are vulnerable or the, you know, whatever, whatever term we tend to use for that. Um, and so, but we focused on the majority and then come back to the major, minority or, and so, it has played out a couple of times, not only in our work, but with the, with the rest that in our rush to move quickly and expeditiously, we don't necessarily lead with who is, who are the populations that are going to be hardest and how do we design and implement based on that first, knowing if we do that well, everybody else will be well served. It's sort of turning the paradigm upside down. And I think that's a place where we have not done as well as we could have, because uh, we came back later. Um, I think we've learned a lot. We've done really well in correcting what we've learned um, in terms of not leading with the most vulnerable and coming back to them later. Um, and the difference, and having said that, we went first with people who are most likely to die as opposed to people most likely to get sick. We've done a really good job with people most likely to die. 
people most likely to get exposed, we continue to struggle in making that the priority um, because it's more complicated, right? And it's the more complicated that tends to, it takes more time, it takes more investment. And when we're running full speed and we don't have somebody who's calling us and has the authority to say the most complicated is where you need to be, it might not be heard as, as strongly as the get it done as fast and as much as you can when you're in a crisis. And so I think that's, that's the difference of what we've learned. I don't know if that really answered what you're saying, but it, it's about inverting the where we focus and you know holding ourselves accountable to that which we care deeply about. But when in crisis, we move fast um, and we move with what's easy and then come back to what's complicated. What, 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 yeah, would it be fair to say that like what I heard you say is the difference this bill might make is it might build a new piece of accountability into the system coming out of the pandemic to a, simply said. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and I would just add to that, uh, what I'm hearing is that it would actually put in place some additional infrastructure that would allow that to happen. Yeah. That when, you, when you're in the midst of rushing, which you do need to do when you're in a crisis, yeah. which we've yeah. been in, uh, that you, you don't have to, you, you're no longer having to build the infrastructure that's going to give you the information and the accountability that you need when you're in the midst of crisis. Absolutely, like having, it, you know. This, this is a part of building building that infrastructure into and accountability into place. Yeah, ongoing. and we now, exactly, we now do have, for example, some, not enough, but some, some rel stronger relationships with community organizations that have the, uh, the ability to reach the people that need to be reached or to help us design the program in a way, but we don't have enough of that. But this is the, this is the way it would be ready for us. And we wouldn't, as you said, Representative Lippert, we wouldn't be building at the same time that we were in crisis. Right. Um, so with that, I would like to take, uh, I mean, we're, we're all pressed for time, but I think it'd, it'd be useful to have uh, Nolan run through uh, his initial, uh, analysis based on the bill as introduced and um, and then uh, I might just add that I think given where we are in the midst of this health crisis national health crisis international health crisis uh, we might actually also there there may there may be some opportunities at the federal level where the underfunding of public health generally which has exacerbated this crisis, all across the country, uh, perhaps there will be some additional attention to that, which might benefit some of all of this uh, moving forward. But with that, uh, Nolan, would you run us through your presentation? Sure. And then, and then uh, we're going to take a break. Yep. Uh, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office, um, as Representative Lippert said, I'm going to be brief. Um, I'm going to put um, the fiscal note should be on the website for those who want to look at it. Um, and you should have it up now. Yes, it's on the screen. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, this is based on the information I have at the moment. And so concerning the Office of Health Equity, uh, the language says um, the shall hire a director, director of health equity and may hire other personnel. So what I did was I looked at different um, pay grades that I thought would fit into those various ranges and came up with what I what would be a range estimate of uh, the cost for a director of health equity, which would be anywhere between 102 and 147 thousand dollars, roughly, when you take into consideration not just salary but benefits and FICA, which is Social Security tax and other. Um, and then we heard Heidi talk about how other personnel would need to be hired as well. And I took a pay grade 24, which is an estimated salary range 52 to 85,000. And you add in the benefits, you know, it could be, um, and that includes health insurance, which could be a single, could be a family plan. So there's a range in there. 
So that plan, that, uh, that particular other employees could range between 65,000 and 117,000 when you add in where they are on the pay scale, um, what they're hired at, what their benefits are. Um, I also make the point, and Heidi made this point too, that much of the health department is funded through grants. Those grants are tied to different things. So people are hired to do the work of that grant. So we can't take money that's being used for another grant for this. So I'm assuming for now it's pure general fund, unless other funds or grants could be identified. But that again would be, uh, um, that would be something that would have to be figured out. Um, so for now, I'm assuming it's general fund. For the Health Equity Advisory Commission, um, we heard how you talk about how that would also need to be staffed. I didn't put that in there, but what I do is the per diems, um, because there's language in there that says public members. So there's 26 members of which 18 are public members. So the other people that aren't public members, we assume would be paid through their jobs. So the public members, because the language in there would we, we'd be entitled to per diems. And we have a standard calculation that we use for per diems. I'm assuming that there would be three in-person meetings. So when you add that all up, it's about $6,400 for per diems, which is um, not a ton of money. Um, and that would come out of the health department budget. Um, grants for uh, grants and promotion of health equity. Again, there's no appropriation for the grant in the bill. Um, so if you were, if you want to do this, we would actually have to have an appropriation in order to do this, um, but there's no appropriation there. We also heard Heidi say that, that this position would likely need a grants manager, so a future fiscal note might address that. And then on the data responsiveness to health equity inquiries, um, we heard from the Green Mountain Care Board the other day that it would be, they would need $165,000 that's gross of which 66,000 would be general fund because they have a bill back. So they would bill back for 99,000 and would need $66,000 in general funds. Uh, at the time, and it actually currently still, I don't know what other costs would be incurred by other departments and agencies across state government. You know, Would the health department need to change some of its contracts or could they do it within their existing budget, which I think I might've heard them say. Um, what about other departments? So those are, those are areas that are sort of up in the air. We don't really know a whole lot about what, what those needs would be. Um, and then the final, finally, this is a summary of what, I just put it into a chart and a summary of, of, um, of what is sort of said in the fiscal note. So that's a quick high level overview. As uh, Chair Lippert has said, um, you know, this is based on the information we have today. Uh, I hope to continue to work with Heidi and David Englander and other folks at the health department and across AHS to get more information and to continue to update the fiscal notes that we can come into more uh, specific numbers to move forward. Great. Thank you, Nolan. I really appreciate uh, your work there. And I would ask you to be in touch with Heidi and to maybe uh, make a subsequent fiscal note based on some of the testimony we heard here today. I'd be happy to check in with you as well. Um, but yep. I think if you, could, if you could do that uh, in the near term, that would be great. Yep. Well, I think this, is, this has been a valuable, this has been valuable to help us understand this bill and also put some context in terms of some of our broader work. Um, as, as I said, we're not, uh, this is not the uh, conclusion of testimony on this bill, but it helps us as we frame some of the questions we have in terms of uh, budget recommendations and uh, et cetera. So with that, uh, according to my clock, it's uh, 10.04. I'm, I'm going to suggest that we uh, take a 15 minute break. Uh, let's, well, let's come back at 10.20 and uh, reconvene and Colleen, you can take us off YouTube during that period of time as well. Um, I don't know if there, we've ever figured out how to let people know when we're coming back, but we'll take a 15 minute break. And then when we, and oh, in the interim, uh, I took the liberty to take some of the work we did yesterday as a committee and uh, took a look at what we had done and I looked at them and said, oh, there's some obvious categorization that we could do. And so I have uh, asked uh, Representative Houghton and she, she again did her magic and reorganized that for us with some headings that I suggested. 
And so I'm going to ask her if she would send it out. You can take a look at it during the break if you like, or take a complete break, and we'll look at it when we come back as we continue our process of uh, uh, budget recommendations. So um, yeah, let's 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 come back at ten ten. Uh, let's say let's come back at ten twenty five. 